explorers, both with NASA and with commercial companies uh, through private space astronauts. Uh, yesterday here at the Museum of Flight, Charles Simoni and Richard Garriott were both here, two people who have flown to space as private citizens. A reminder for today's program, if you're watching on NASA TV or if you're just joining us, today's panels will be replayed and available on YouTube at the NASA Television YouTube site. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search on NASA Television, all of our panel discussions should be uploaded this afternoon. Uh, also, if you have uh, a communications device with you here today, you can follow us on Twitter at pound NASA future. Uh, we'll also be taking questions from Twitter followers at the, throughout the uh, panel discussion today. Uh, our next panel this afternoon, is, or this morning, I believe, uh, is going to be on uh, commercial space investments and benefits for the nation. We have here today a gathering of uh, some truly extraordinary people, uh, people who are leading the businesses that are opening up low Earth orbit uh, and access to the space station through uh, truly innovative and new spacecraft. Uh, to lead the panel discussion today is once again our friend from the Museum of Flight, Doug King. I've enjoyed getting to know Doug, and I know he's passionate both about the past and the present, but also very much about the future. So I'll turn it over to Doug. Doug. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. We worried a lot about developing questions ahead of time. It looks from that first panel that that won't be necessary, that you're very willing to participate in the discussion, and that's exactly what we would like to do up here. Uh, since we have limited time, I'm going to dispense with individual introductions of our esteemed panel. There are great bios in the folder that you got in the program you got on the way in, but I have to introduce them as a group. Uh, when Lori Garver spoke this morning, she talked about the analogy between what's happening now in commercial space and the personal computer world. Well, I worked in Silicon Valley in the late 1970s, and I saw some of those conversations with people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and others, and she's right. This is, has more feel to that than anything that I've seen since. Um, we speculated what would it have been like to be able to sit in and, at a bar and listen to in, maybe in Palo Alto, California after somebody went over to Hewlett Packard and stole some parts to build an Apple I or II and listen to those folks talk to each other back then about what they thought the world was going to be like. Well, that's what we're doing here this morning. There's no beer, uh, we, but we're gonna, we ask our panelists to act as if all the rest of us were listening in on them and their vision of where they're going. Why is their company, their, their endeavor, um, worth spending the time and energy and career that they're each investing in it? Because we have to get that across to the public, that this isn't something that's going to happen maybe someday in the future. It's something that's happening today right around us. We went outside a few minutes ago and uh, met some of the Washington Aerospace Scholars students. Right behind them were a bunch of eight-year-olds from a girls' school here looking at those high school kids and saying, gee, I, I hope I can be them someday, and those high school kids looking at this panel saying, I hope I can be them someday. So I'm going to get out of the way and just let them introduce themselves with a brief introduction, a, a discussion about what their uh, passion is, what their company or organization is doing, and then open it up to a conversation among them that we can all listen into and participate in. So let's start right next to me here with Phil McAllister from NASA. Phil. Thanks, Doug. I'm very happy to be here. And I work at NASA headquarters where I oversee the commercial crew and cargo programs, the development piece of that. And uh, I want to thank you, Doug, for inviting us here. This is a beautiful facility. Um, it obviously provides a lot of information about spaceflight, but also inspiration. And I think that's really important as we go forward. Um, and I'm sort of a testament to that inspiration, in my opinion. I vividly remember being a high school senior, um, and when people asked me, well, what do you want to do as a career, Phil? It was very simple. I knew it right away. I want to be shortstop for the Mets. I mean, come on. That's, <laughs> I was at high school as a senior. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and that was my answer right up until the time I saw a story about the space shuttle uh, on my hometown newspaper with a big picture of the shuttle. This was in 1981. And uh, I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever seen, uh, a spaceship landing on a runway. Uh, that's when I decided to be an aerospace engineer, and here I am at NASA uh, 
helping to bring about the, the systems that are going to follow on the space shuttle. And at NASA, we're very much following a dual course today for space transportation. Um, for deep space missions, we're going to be using the space launch system and the multi-purpose crew vehicle. You've seen some of the videos about that. Those are going to be very uh, uh, more traditional programs and systems similar to the space shuttle. But for low Earth orbit, where the International Space Station travels, that's a place that we've been many times, over 150 times uh, over the last 40 years. So we feel like it's time now to transition some of the responsibility for launching crew and cargo to low Earth orbit to the private sector. Um, and that brings me to my fe fellow panelists. Uh, they represent some of the companies that are helping to do that and develop these systems. And that's where I re receive my inspiration today seeing these people and their co-workers coming up with new and innovative designs. There's not a single solution, there's multiple solutions. Uh, they're very different, some have capsules, some have wing bodies, there's new engines, new support systems, um, all designed to take people and cargo to low Earth orbit. So that's, uh, that what, that's what I find very exciting today and being a part of that I really like. So I remember I was very sad when the space shuttle was retired, uh, but I have been re-energized recently by seeing these new commercial systems come into being, along with the opportunities that they're going to represent. Um, honestly, not everybody at NASA is comfortable with this new role of transitioning uh, crew and cargo to low Earth orbit to the private sector. Um, but once again, it's only for low Earth orbit, and we think that that is appropriate. Beyond low Earth orbit, we're going to follow in a more traditional path. And I would say, if not now, when? I really think this is inevitable. Uh, the time is right. These aerospace companies are mature. They're ready to do this. And again, it's very exciting to see different designs come into being. So consistent with this shift, I'm also going to just take that much time and shift most of my minutes over to uh, the people actually doing the work. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Gwen Shotwell, SpaceX, you made a big announcement this morning. Yeah, it was great news. Uh, so we uh, had some discussions with Mike Suffredini yesterday uh, uh, to determine a launch date. And uh, we decided that February 7th was the right day to shoot for. And uh, that really kind of focuses all the activities for the next 60 days. Uh, we're thrilled to get there. Uh, we're thrilled uh, that NASA is letting us. Uh, get there. So uh, kudos to NASA and the teams we've been working with. So I was asked to shortly, and I'm always short for those of you that know me, um, I, I much prefer to answer questions than, than blab on here, um, answer two questions. Why is my company doing what it's doing and why am I doing it as well? Um, so SpaceX was founded by Elon Musk. We are doing exactly what we're doing because of him and his vision. Uh, he believes that it is absolutely essential to the human race uh, to provide the capabilities to move beyond Earth uh, for humans. Um, it's, a, it's a giant goal. Uh, he's quite the visionary. Um, and every decision that we make at SpaceX uh, is focused on that particular piece, taking crew, uh, taking crew to space. Falcon 1 was a great pathfinder for the eventual Falcon 9 that can actually carry crew. Um, and uh, as you see kind of in the evolution of our products, Dragon Cargo is a nice foundation, a great foundation uh, to carry crew as well. So um, I want to also talk a little bit about why space. Uh, I, I get asked this question quite a bit. I think there's two real reasons why people, uh, or how you talk about why we should go to space. Uh, for policymakers, you have to have some reason, right? You have to have some kind of concrete rationale. Uh, and Jack Marburger said it better than anyone that I've ever heard. Uh, exploration of space comes down to deciding whether we want to bring the solar system within mankind's sphere of economic influence. Great reason to, to get to space. But I think there's other reasons that are harder to explain. Um, humans explore for competition, uh, for curiosity, uh, and to take really great chances to improve their and more critically their families lives moving forward if you think about the great exploration the great exploration uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries um, people do it to improve lives and leave a mark um, and I, those are the harder things to talk about but that's founded in our genes it's hard to give rationale it just is okay so that's that's the piece on SpaceX and, and why SpaceX uh, and for me um, I actually came into the space industry a little serendipitously 
Uh, I was actually very interested in cars as a kid. I remember reading in third grade about how an engine works, which I thought was really fascinating at the time. Um, but uh, so my, my venture into the space industry, as serendipitous as it was, I was immediately engaged. Uh, I think for an engineer, there is no greater chance uh, or opportunity for solving really hard problems and the challenges that are there. Uh, so it's a, great, it's a great venue to do really difficult but uh, inspirational things. Um, another reason, actually, and a little bit more pragmatic, is uh, I think uh, space is the best place to inspire children to do great things and study hard and, uh, and focus on uh, changing the world. I can't think of a better venue for that, uh, for kids. Um, and I'm going to leave the stage with one comment. Uh, under the Chinese zodiac, 2012 is the year of the dragon. Oh, that's good. <laughs> we will all be rooting for you on February 7th. Gwen reminds me February 7th is a test. We will all be rooting for a successful test. Yes. Um, next down the way, Peter McGrath, the Boeing Company, familiar name here in Seattle, building a few airplanes. We were so excited about the announcement not long ago, 500 new jobs at Kennedy Space Center. Peter. Thank you. Uh, yes, I am the uh, business development director for space exploration for Boeing down in Houston, Texas. Although I'd say I'm a native Californian, so I'm learning to deal with the weather in Texas, but it's been a good challenge. Uh, you know, when you think about Boeing, I was going to share this. You know, I get on the plane quite often, and first question you start talking to somebody about is, uh, who do you work for? And I say Boeing, and they say, wow, you work in the airplane business. It's like, well, actually, no, I, I work on the NASA side. and. It's quite often, you know, when you talk to people about Boeing, they don't think about the fact that we've actually been in partnership with NASA for over 50 years. So if you date back to all the programs we worked on in human spaceflight, we've actually worked on every program with the exception of the LEM. So that includes Gemini, uh, Mercury, Apollo, Space Station, Skylab, um, as well as the, sh uh, the shuttle. So, you know, we've worked every program and we really know how to uh, deliver humans into space safely and operate in space. So when you ask why Boeing's uh, pursuing commercial crew, which is one of the questions we were asked to answer today, it just seems like the natural ne next step. When you look at our 70 years of actually operating commercial airplanes and taking that and applying those commercial practices into how we actually fly humans into space, it's a pretty easy transition, especially when you think about the technology that's already there. And we're not really reinventing new technology to get to LEO. It's something we've done, as we said, for 50 years. So it's really about taking new innovation, new commercial approaches, partnering with NASA on new ways of doing business. And it's been very successful. If you look at the progress that everybody has made in the last two years on this program, it's pretty impressive. So when you ask the question about, you know, why am I in aerospace, I'm, I'm probably more typical, I think, than some. My father was an aerospace engineer. I grew up in an aerospace house. Um, I actually was introduced to rockets early on. Uh, I was barely old enough to actually see uh, humans walk on the moon, which was an amazing feat to see. I think it was even a black and white TV at the time. And then I remember uh, sophomore year in high school, I wasn't good enough to make the meds. But um, you know, I, somebody asked me, what were you going to do when you get through with high school? And I said, well, I'm going to go to college, be an aerospace engineer, and I'm going to work on space station. Six years later, I graduated from USC with an aerospace engineering degree, and I was working on space station five days later. So I really fulfilled my dream, and, and it, I'd say my dad was my biggest inspiration, but I'd also say, you know, seeing somebody walk on the moon. So we need to create that next environment, somebody walking on the moon to really energize the next generation of aerospace engineers. So I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Mark Sarangelo from Sierra Nevada. Good morning. This is a really amazing event. I think when, when I was, had the opportunity to walk around the buildings yesterday and today, it may, brought to mind the question of why are we here and why are we doing this. We, we uh, at Sierra Nevada, I'm fortunate to be the, leading this group of amazing people who are developing a, an orbital vehicle called the Dream Chaser. Dream Chaser is a lifting body it means it's a wing vehicle that could be piloted or unpiloted and has a, its legacy in a vehicle that NASA designed and, and took to uh, a very serious level about 10 years ago. 
And we picked it up and we began developing it. And we did that for a reason. We felt that the, the legacy of the space shuttle over 135 missions and, and the 30 years that it was doing, there was a spirit behind that program. There was a, an, an inspiration behind what it did and how it did it. And so many people were involved in that program. And, it, and what we felt was that as we go to space to the next level, that there is a need for different types of vehicles. There are different missions in space, like we do in our Navy and in our Air Force and other things that we do. There's never really one way to go about doing something. Ours is a lifting body, which means that it's piloted. It can take seven crew and critical cargo to and from LEO and return them to a runway landing. And we felt that being able to do that, to be able to return those, those people who have been on the station for a long time and return those critical work. And many people look at the space station. It's, it's not an observatory. It's not really there for people to take pictures out the window. What it is, it's a laboratory. And there's a, an amazing amount of work that gets done on that station. And we felt that to be able to do that and, and to uh, enable that laboratory to be as productive as it possibly can, it was something that was one of our goals. But really what we're, what we're after, when we think of where we are in human spaceflight in the United States right now, we don't have a vehicle in this country that can take humans to orbit for the first time in, in 50 plus years. Right now we're reliant on our Russian partners to be able to do that. In our view, and I think collectively amongst many of us here, that American knowledge, American technology, American workers can do the same thing. We can build something like what we're talking about building, take it to orbit, and return that capability back here to the United States. So we're very, very pleased with, uh, with where we're going on our, on our progress with our program. We've just announced we finished our 10th milestone in a row uh, on time and on budget. And I think the, the understanding that the industry that we've built and the team certainly that we've built at Sierra Nevada has the capability of making this happen. But it's more than that. It's, it's also being able to, to see something build and grow from, from nothing, from, from an inspiration. And one of the things that people forget as we walk around and see all the great things that Boeing have done up here in Seattle, that there was a Boeing, and it was a family, it was a person, like we are. We're individuals who believe in something and believe that we can make a difference and, and be able to change something in the future. And I think that's the personal inspiration for me, is be able to, to do something that hasn't been done in this way before, to be able to fly something that that I hope to be able to fly in the next few years and be able to take it and, and understand that this is something that we've designed and built and developed. And there's no better, I think, satisfaction than being able to take that dream and, and make it a reality. And then to look in the faces of, of all the kids that come by. For, for everything people say about the space program not being moving forward, I, I think we all collectively would disagree with that. Uh, I went to the last shuttle launch and there were a million people who took their lives, took time out of their lives to go down and see that. It, it's just an, an amazing amount of spirit and amazing amount of energy and, and we're very happy to be part of that and very happy to be leading this, working with NASA as a true partner in this program. It's, they've been an amazing partner for what we're doing and it's difficult for government to change and we're seeing that happen right now. We're in a different world and a different environment and, and what we have here is a private-public partnership to take something to the next level. So we're very appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I saw a presentation on Dream Chaser at a conference not long ago by Steve Lindsay who just happened to be the guy that landed Discovery on its last mission, and it really struck me that it's not a lot of new people in these fields, it's people who got their experience in other aerospace companies now taking it to the next step. Um, our next speaker is one of those, um, Rob Meyerson. I talked about a, a local company here named Boeing. There's another local company here that people don't know quite as well yet, Blue Origin. Okay. Thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you to the Museum of Flight and NASA for setting up this, uh, this wonderful event. Um, the uh, Blue Origin was created in the year 2000 specifically to uh, uh, enable enduring, enduring human presence in space. So we are a human spaceflight company and we're creating um, safe and affordable human spaceflight. Uh, and we have the a founder, um, Jeff Bezos, uh, the founder and CEO of Amazon.com, who has the, the long-term long -term vision and the resources to carry that through to, uh, to fulfillment, to a, to a finish. The, uh, like many here, um, I grew up watching uh, American astronauts land on the moon. Um, that's uh, not a new story for many of you. Um, it was very exciting for me. I remember my fifth birthday playing in the, the cardboard lunar module that my parents had bought me, and, and I, I just remember that day very, very clearly. 
Um, I built a lot of model rockets as a kid, flew them out of the front yard of our house, probably not something you'd be allowed to do today, but uh, um, I graduated from that to uh, making my own propellants with the chemistry set that I had. And, uh, and then later, uh, uh, graduating to using some of the propellants or some of the chemicals that weren't even in the set that my older brothers had uh, handed down to me in a, in a way that I might tell some people over a beer someday. But uh, um, <laughs> the... Uh, beers now, Derek can bring them. <laughs> Not today. Phil, <laughs> maybe... Uh, yeah. Um, after, uh, in high school, I considered architecture for a little while, and I uh, really, really enjoyed uh, the vision of, of putting together a building or a house, uh, but lucky for me, I, I moved on to engineering fairly quickly. I went to the University of Michigan, um, and I met one of my first mentors. And there's two mentors I want to mention today because I think mentorship in an industry like ours is very important to help young people guide, help to guide young people to see this to the finish because it's, uh, it's not an easy path, uh, aerospace engineering. Um, it's not easy technically, and it's not easy from a, um, from a business standpoint because it is so cyclical. Um, professor Harm Buning was a, um, a professor, uh, an expert in astrodynamics at the University of Michigan. Um, he had the, uh, the uh, challenge of teaching the astronauts in the Apollo program. He went to Houston for a summer during, uh, during the 60s, taught, taught the astronauts astrodynamics. At that time, he fell in love with Houston and the Johnson Space Center. And um, as a professor, um, and his passion for, for space, for human spaceflight and aerospace, that really, really rubbed off on, on people like me. Um, based on his contacts he made teaching at a, at a great institution, um, he developed a grassroots co-op program, which he encouraged me to, to join and, and recommended me for a position at the Johnson Space Center after graduation, or as a co-op, and then uh, I later went to work there after graduation. Um, once I went down there for that first, first co-op tour, and if you don't know what a co-op program is, it's, it's mixing in real-world experience with your, your um, education, so alternating semesters Going, leaving your, your school and going, going to your place of employment, um, I was hooked. It was, uh, it was amazing working with these people at NASA. Um, and I went there you know, full time after college, um, spent 12 years um, working on the space, space shuttle, working on the space station, crew rescue vehicles. Um, and I was able to see firsthand the talent that, that is there, tremendous amount of talent within the agency, within the industry, um, and, uh, and how much dedication and effort it takes to, to, to make human spaceflight work. Um, much later, I came to learn that I was hired based solely on the recommendation of Harm Buning, <laughs> um, not because of my application. You know, it was, it was, hey, Professor Buning sent your application down. I, I don't need to know anymore. This is, this is it. So my, my um, advice, it doesn't happen to everybody, but when you seek out a mentor, um, understand, you know, what they're, what they're going to do for you um, and, and uh, don't let them down. So, uh, um, while at JSC, I also met a man named John Kiker, and John Kiker is the man who came up with the idea to, to ferry fly the orbiters on the back of a 747, uh, because early in the shuttle program, they had uh, come up with the idea of putting air-breathing engines on, and they were going to fly these orbiters, and the Russians actually did this with the Buran. Um, John came up with that idea, but before that, he had worked at Wright Field on parachutes. He'd worked with some of the Germans that came over from uh, um, after World War II. Uh, and then he came to JSC and he led the development of the parachute systems for Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Um, John's influence on me was really one of community and pushing me to join AIAA and get in actively involved in the community. Uh, at that time as a young engineer, I was getting involved with the Aerodynamic Decelerator Systems Technical Committee, got involved with that group for a number of years, um, working, met people all over the industry, people at Sandia Labs uh, that are probably um, some of the best in, best in the world at what they do. Um, working with the nuclear stockpile and things like that. So it was a little different from my human spaceflight experience, but uh, uh, a highly talented group of people um, as well. Um, as my, uh, I wanted to get an industry perspective, and so my wife and I moved to Seattle, and I went to work for a company called Kistler Aerospace. And uh, while at Kistler, there was a number of NASA veterans there. We were developing the world's first fully reusable um, uh, launch vehicle. And uh, it was a, uh, um, an industry team that was put together, and unfortunately, the economy downturn in the late 90s led to, led to Kistler's demise, and uh, I was looking for another, another place to go, and I, I heard about Blue Origin through some of the many contacts I had made. And so uh, once I'd heard about Blue Origin and met Jeff Bezos and, and learned of his vision, I knew that, that this was an opportunity to get back into human spaceflight and build a, build a company from the ground up. So um, we're a company of about 150 people um, right now. Uh, we've grown from about 10 people from when I started back, uh, back uh, eight years ago, and uh, 
Um, we're step by step uh, incrementally developing uh, human space flight capabilities. Um, the, uh, I was asked to speak about my views of the future and then how we can encourage young people to get into the industry. And I do have a few opinions. Um, I personally believe we're a nation of explorers. I think we all do here at the table. Uh, space represents that next frontier. Um, and, and I believe that strong investments in science tech and technology will, uh, will make us stronger. So, so, you know, the beginning of my career marked probably the, the greatest contraction in the aerospace industry where companies merged together. And, and I'm really glad to be on the forefront of the reversal of that trend where new companies like the you know, the, the people sitting next to me today are starting, we're getting at the forefront of starting these new companies to grow an aerospace industry that can, that can be more creative, more competitive, um, and create a more vibrant industry for the future. Um, if you look in history and you look at the competitors for the space shuttle, uh, and look at the pre-phase A studies, uh, Dennis Jenkins wrote an excellent book on the history of the space shuttle. Um, it is amazing how many companies that don't exist today by name, uh, the culture and their, their, their parts exist somewhere deep in, the, in, in the, the larger organizations that absorb them, but, uh, but uh, it's fantastic what those, those people, what those teams came up with. Uh, and, and in the end, the resulting space shuttle, of course, is a phenomenal machine, but the, all the ideas and the creativity that went into uh, getting to where we, where we got was uh, really amazing as well. Um, the uh, final point, um, here we go, I'll lose my... Let's talk about kids and young people and getting them into, into the aerospace industry. I have three young kids, uh, eight, ten, uh, 8, 11, and 13. My daughter's looking to go to high school uh, next year and took her to information night at Aviation High School uh, last month. Uh, aviation High School is an amazing place um, here in Seattle. We're, we're lucky to have it here in Seattle. Um, kids today have opportunities that we didn't have. And uh, if, you're, if you're passionate about space, um, follow that passion. And, uh, and combine that passion with, with the hands-on activities that, we, that, that, our, that our kids have today, like FIRST. Uh, FIRST Robotics is, a, is, a, um, is you know, like a rock concert for kids that are interested in science tech and technology. Um, Design, Build, Fly, an, organ, a, a, an activity the, AI, the AIAA puts on for college students. Uh, Solar Car, Formula SAE, all these projects that, that students have, project-based learning is, uh, is very important for, for the, our future of uh, aerospace engineers. So, so I wanted to, to leave you with that point, and, and uh, um, if, you're, if you're looking to come into this industry, please uh, follow it through. It's not going to be easy, but follow it through to the end. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. And last but certainly not least, at the end of the table, uh, Steve Isakowicz from Virgin Galactic. Thank you very much, Doug. And I want to thank the sponsors for inviting me to be here. I'm a little bit different than the panelists that are sitting to the right of me in that uh, we're offering something different, which is the opportunity to get into space and open up the frontier to all. And if I could actually just see by a raise of hands, how many people sitting in the audience today would like to go to space someday? <laughs> all right. That's great. Parts, That's a good customer base that we could build upon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yesterday, I had a chance to sit through the dedication of the wonderful uh, Charles Simone uh, Space Gallery. And, and Doug, in his opening comments, talked about it in a way that actually I thought really, really hit the mark. He talked about the museum being a place not just talking about history, but to inspire for the future. Uh, words that we use were words like uh, inspiration, uh, innovation. Uh, and vision, and, and I want to come back to those words when I when I have a chance to talk about where, where the future will take us. A week from tomorrow is actually going to be the uh, anniversary of the Wright brothers. Certainly, a big event. That's uh, going to be 108 years uh, since the Wright brothers first took off. Uh, there's also another pretty interesting anniversary event that follows it uh, three days after, and that is actually the first production flight of the Bo Boeing 707. And it was really through the 707 that really opened up for commercial application, transportation for all of us. And it wasn't just a military plane and it wasn't just a transport, but it was something that we all could fly on. And from that spurned a whole great family of, of, uh, of vehicles that, that, that came from that. Um, in 1961, Alan Shepard was the first American astronaut and he did that through a suborbital launch. Um, and I'd like to think that 54 years after that, just like, after, like the 707, uh, we will be busy uh, at Virgin Galactic being the first provider of suborbital launches to all of you here in the audience. Um, so what are we doing at Virgin? Well, we have a design that's based upon the heritage of the vehicles that had won the X Prize 
uh, Spaceship One and White Knight One. Um, under the vision of Richard Branson, who is a person who has uh, the, the wherewithal and the excitement to try to explore at the frontiers, uh, followed up from that event to make a major investment in the next generation of those vehicles, which we call White Knight Two and Spaceship Two. Uh, having the ability to have the White Knight carry the Spaceship Two at an appropriate altitude at 50,000 feet, dropping what is essentially a rocket plane, and powering for a suborbital flight into space for six lucky individuals. Um, we have about almost approaching 500 people that are signed up that would like to have that experience of a, a suborbital flight into space. Uh, we've also more recently have opened it up to researchers and, and education. Uh, we've had different universities and consortium who have come to us and actually have put down reservations to fly. Uh, more recently, NASA had a program that uh, sometimes referred to as Cruiser or the Flight Opportunities Program, where in fact we're going to be flying some, some uh, NASA-sponsored experiments on our, our vehicles. Um, which brings it to me, what brought me here? Uh, I, I was inspired very early on through the Apollo program. I mean, the, frankly, if any of you have seen the Saturn V, uh, there, there's no vehicle that really gets your heart throbbing when you see something as tall as the Washington Monument being able to, to lift off. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna tell a story that hopefully my mom's not watching us uh, or, 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 or Twittering. Um, <laughs> When I was a kid eight years old during the uh, actual uh, moon landing of Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong went to step on the moon, uh, I remember I was kind of getting impatient because it actually took a while for NASA to kind of clear him to go and step down and it was very late on the uh, East Coast. Um, I had my, sitters, my sister sitting next to me and invariably we got into a big fight. Um, my mom being a little upset with us, she says, you two need to go to bed. So I actually never saw Neil Armstrong put his first step on the moon. And, and, and I said from that day on, I'm going to somehow be a part of a future effort that'll get us back to the moon. So in part, I could say my mom was helping to be my inspiration to want to explore into the future. And let me just finish it on the three words that I had mentioned up front, uh, which was uh, innovation, uh, inspiration, and vision. You know, with regards to innovation, one of the things I, I note in the um, space industry which I had been out of the last few years and only recently joined at uh, Virgin Galactus as, as the chief technology officer, is unlike other, other industries that have, you know, like Moore's Law for uh, the, the computer industry with this, the speed of electronics doubling uh, every uh, couple years, we don't really have the equivalent in the space industry. In fact, if you look at the economics of space travel, really the cost has either remained the same or maybe increased depending on how, how you do the math. Um, I think the challenge to the panel here and what we're all trying to do is to change that, to, to create our, our, our own law that perhaps maybe every five years the, the price of space travel will be cut in half so that more and more people would have the opportunity to enjoy uh, space travel and allow uh, us to push the frontier of space exploration. Second, with regards to uh, inspiration, uh, when I first got this job, I, I went back to my alma mater at MIT, which I often do to give talks in terms of, of what's going on in various fields. And one of the things I was really struck by is I went back to my old department, uh, my aerospace department at, at MIT, and usually when I go and give talks, you know, I'll maybe get 10, 15, 20% of the students that would be in attendance from, from the whole department. Um, when I gave the talk about a month ago, it was about 60 or 70% of the student population from the department that was actually sitting in on the talk. I mean, the room was filled. And it's not because I'm a, a great storyteller or a great speaker, but I really believe it's the subject matter. I, I really believe that those of us here on the panel, and hopefully those of you in the audience that want to be a part of it, are really at the forefront of something really exciting. And I think it's truly inspirational in a way that's capturing imagination, which we haven't had in, in a number of years. Uh, last point I want to make is just one of a vision. Uh, one of the things that, for me, makes it exciting to be at uh, Virgin Galactic is, you know, when you talk to people who've had the opportunity to be in space, they talk about how transformative it is to, to actually see the beauty of our planet, to see its curvatures, to see the uh, countries without borders, um, and just to see this, you know, blue pale dot out there in the vast blackness of space is something that has transformed them, you know, in, in their lives. And I want to sort of finish uh, my opening comments by reading a quote of uh, uh, one of our test pilots, Brian Benny, who flew uh, during Spaceship One when uh, uh, Scale Composites uh, won the uh, X Prize competition, which I think sort of summarizes the attitude of, 
of, of those of us that are venturing in this new area. Uh, he wrote, he uh, said after he flew, I wake up every morning and thank God I live in a country where all of this is possible, where you have the Yankee ingenuity to roll up your sleeves, get a band of people who believe in something and go for it and make it happen. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Thank you. All right, I'll lead this off with a question I've gotten from a lot of people. And you're welcome to come up to the microphone. We've got a couple of questions on Twitter already, and let's make this a discussion. When? We're not gonna ask you proprietary. We're not gonna ask you for specific predictions. But what you, what, how is this gonna unfold over the next five, 10, 15 years? Who wants to take a shot at that? You see, everybody's got their, Gwen's got a launch on February 7th. So, Could, so you're I, asking, what's the future? How is it going to evolve? What's going to happen when in the next few years? It, you can tell us specifically what your plan is or what you think other people are going to do. When will this, will the public be, we can buy a ticket now on Virgin Galactic. When are you going to fly, Steve? When can we, do we think Dream Chaser will be at the space station? Um, you know, when will SpaceX be going back and forth regularly with commercial, with the NASA astronauts and so on? We've been pretty public about, uh, about uh, when we anticipate getting crew to LEO. Um, so we're shooting for uh, 2014. One of the uh, really wonderful things about being in this business is when you finally get the chance to uh, touch real hardware that's going to go to space. I know Gwyn feels that way. And this uh, weekend, we're getting delivery of our first flight vehicle. And we're expecting to start flying next summer on our first test flights. So it's become really quite real for us, and that makes us all smile. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, Mark. Uh, we just delivered our uh, thrust chamber to uh, Stennis Space Center uh, last month. It was received and unpacked, and, uh, and the team at Stennis with Blue Origin is working to install that engine and test it early next year. And uh, uh, when you when you it, it becomes a reality. We're developing, you know, uh, a LOX hydrogen booster engine that'll power a, a reusable, a reusable launch vehicle here in the future that'll that'll carry people to and from space. And and that is, uh, that is a, a big bold bold vision. And uh, and we're excited about it. So. Uh, we've had a lot of activity already underway. Uh, what makes our effort as unique is on every flight we have people on it. So for us, it's uh, you know safety first in everything we do. Uh, we've had 78 flights of the uh, White Knight Two. Um, of those flights, we've had 16 where we've had glide flights of the Spaceship 2. Next year, we're anticipating we're going to have the first what we call powered flights with the rocket motor, which we will do incremental uh, uh, steps from there until we achieve safely being able to reach the altitude of, uh, of being into space. And then once we have a chance to prove that out and working with the FAA, we expect to have uh, uh, open up for commercial operations soon thereafter. Okay, from the Boeing perspective, so we, we continue to do uh, significant risk reduction and development efforts, including uh, we have a parachute drop test coming up, which will validate our whole reentry approach, and as well as doing some um, development of our actual booster, our um, abort engine booster at the flight configuration. We're going to do some testing on that later this year. You know, we're going to go into test flights in 14 and, and uh, hopefully be operational by 15 as our target. So Soon. looking more longer term, I'll just throw my two cents in. I think next year we're going to start seeing regular cargo runs to and from the International Space Station from both SpaceX and Orbital Sciences. I think in about five years we're going to see regular crew runs to and from the International Space Station and low Earth orbit. I think in about 10 years, uh, whatever administration is in office will make an announcement that they're going to extend the life of the space station for another 10 years. Uh, I think we should fly the space station as long as it's safe and productive. So I don't see 2020 as a as a necessarily an end date. And uh, also, right around that time, 10 years from now, we should probably be having our first crewed flight on our space launch system and uh, doing beyond low Earth orbit uh, exploration again. I would say for all the students, one thing is there's a lot of stuff happening near term. In general, my experience is it never happens as fast as we'd like. So, uh, so patience, as well as the keep with it attitude that Rob had mentioned, which is important, um, is I think for those of us in the aerospace industry, we, we, we do need to have patience. Sometimes these things don't happen as fast as, they, as we would like, uh, but we are moving forward and in a direction that I think is, is positive. That's, that's the key. 
But the interesting thing about all your answers is that these private astronauts, or whatever we end up calling them, aren't in classrooms today. They're already working for you. There are already people that are out in industry. And what students can be thinking about is a platform where this already exists. What, what do I do? What comes next? Which uh, I'll take the first Twitter question, then we'll go to our live uh, questioners here, because the first question was actually from one of those people. It says, I'm a, a young engineer already in the aerospace industry. What are the opportunities for me? Who's hiring? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Notice that I didn't raise my hand. You know, NASA's been pretty flat, but it's, this is where the growth is, and I think that's important. Any suggestions for all those engineers that are already out there and thinking, boy, this sounds like an exciting place to, to head my career? Anything specific they ought to be trying to pay attention to, places they ought to be, people to talk to? I can tell you from our perspective, we, uh, part of our plan is actually to have a significant part of our team be university driven. And we've got relationships uh, with a couple of universities already. And one, the University of Colorado, was engaged with graduate and undergraduate students who are actually working with us on the building of our Dream Chaser. And I can't tell you the, the excitement that's in, on their face when they see this. This is real hardware that's going to fly, and they're going to be part of potentially what is uh, America's next vehicle in space. And they uh, helped design our, our uh, scale model drop test vehicle, which we flew last year. And the, the idea was that we were helping out the students and they were going to get this exciting involvement. And I have to tell you that it's turned out the other way, that the energy, the, the enthusiasm, what they brought to, to us makes us all realize why we got in this business and why we're still there. And it's just an amazing thing. My only concern is that my consumption of Red Bull has gone up four times <laughs> since they've come on board. <laughs> I'd like to give some advice to students. Uh, it's absolutely critical for you to work on uh, real projects, hardware, software projects. Um, PowerPoint works in this industry only to a certain extent, and it, the best engineers that we find are, uh, and students that we hire are the ones that have done the design build fly, the SAE, formula SAE. Those hands-on projects make you much better engineers because you get to make your mistakes, learn, and re-spin it. And if I could add to that, um, I think summer internships is a great opportunity while you're in college to actually get the kind of experience that, that Gwen's talking about. It makes you much more attractive to people that want to hire you, but I think it also gives you sort of early experience of, of what it's going to be like. So uh, at Virgin Galactic, we're actually taking summer internships if you're interested. We have a summer internship at Blue Origin as well. We've had one since 2002. We hire both college and high school students. Um, the high school students come from aviation, so I'll put a plug in there as well. So. Uh, can't hire uh, na nationwide for, uh, for high school student internships. But uh, uh, I want to point out uh, one thing. We have a pretty vibrant internship program. And uh, um, uh, one of our recent interns from last summer just went to work for, is coming to work for Mark. And, uh, and I'll say, while I, while I would have liked to have hired him you know, for Blue, I'm happy that he's going into the industry, and particularly into the commercial industry, because it makes us all stronger. These are brilliant kids. Uh, um, they're brilliant people. Uh, and they're, they're going to be great engineers. So uh, uh, we need to keep those kinds of programs going. So. Thank you, Rob, for training him. <laughs> <laughs> started with you, Mark. So, so if I could add one comment, which was, uh, you know, we talked about the environment for hiring. You know, I, I went through a couple of cycles on station back in the, in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, where it dipped pretty severely. And I'd say we probably have lived through that dip last year. It was, it's been a tough year for the reason, primarily, um, I think, because of the gap that, caught, that occurred with the retirement of shuttle and then uh, the t decisions made on all those future generation exploration systems kind of came a little bit later. So that caused a little ripple effect in the environment for, I think, the industrial base. But if you look at where we are today with NASA moving forward with SLS, MPCV, commercial crew, and you look at all the things that they're putting in place for the future of human spaceflight, I think there is opportunity out there as we look forward in the next several years for jobs in the market to grow. And, and I'd say, you know, if you look at the demographics in the market, there is a, a need to backfill with uh, younger engineers coming in and training because there is a significant amount of senior engineers that need to definitely train so that they can at some day retire, hopefully. So I think there's definitely an opportunity. I think we kind of hit the low in the middle of this year, and I think we're going to start seeing things hopefully get a little better going forward. Thank you. Let's go to our first question over here. Thank you. Uh, Joe Bruce, Solar System Ambassador. And children have been mentioned a lot today. I want to focus a little bit more on elementary kids. Math and science, we need to get our kids hooked on math and science early. 
because by the time they get into junior high and high school, we may lose them. What can your companies do to help our elementary school teachers get these kids hooked in math and science so that we can continue to be world leaders in what you're doing? Well, I'm glad to start on that one because I, I want these people out there building spaceships and thinking about going to the future. I think that's really the job of people like us in the museum world and educators. It was a great, I mentioned earlier today, the great uh, meeting here yesterday afternoon of museums and educators and uh, media from around the country talking about exactly how we can do that. And these people being here today and sharing their stories with us is what helps. If any of them have a specific comment, great, but that's really our yeah, job. Yeah, I'd like to answer that. I think what you have heard from all of us, and I'm no exception, is that we were all inspired when we were 10 years old or below. Most of the people who are in the space industry and most people who work for me have that in common. And we, we can't forget how we came from where we are. I think one of the things that really does opens that up is to bring those, those kids into seeing what we can do, bring them into the factory tours, get it, give them a chance to see things that are, are working live and, and in person, and bringing, particularly having class visits, which we do in our company to have, have students come by, because you never know what student you're gonna be able to spark, just like all of us, I think, got that spark when we were kids. So it, it's in a serious, we think it's a serious approach on our, on our company's part, and I think all of us feel the same way that we have to be able to reach out and, and make sure that that next generation or two generations from now is going to be there to pick up the mantle. Yeah. We, we operate a space launch facility in West Texas down in the, in Culberson County, just a little bit north of Van Horn, Texas. Uh, it's about 2,500 people in that community. We invite the fifth grade class from Eagle Elementary to, to come in and tour, tour the site every year. And um, it's a small thing, but it uh, uh, reaches out. These, these kids are growing up in a community that's, that's not one of the wealthiest communities in the country, and, and they, uh, they have a thriving space business in their, in their community, and they're able to, uh, what we hope is over the years that, that they'll, they'll look forward to being in fifth grade so they can go tour uh, and go, go, go get a look at the site out there. So uh, uh, it's a small thing, but it's, uh, it's one, of, one of many things. It's going to take a, a whole community of people to do those, those kinds of things. So. So I'll I, go back to Steve's earlier comment that uh, the, his mom did tweet in, I can't believe you told that story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it gets to the role of parents and all of us in the room in, in exactly what the gentleman <laughs> said of, in, of talking to young people about these things, not when they're in high school, not when they're in college, when they're about six or seven years old and giving them the experiences that shape their perception of what it's okay and what it's cool to do. You know, I think yeah. that's true. I'm sorry to interrupt, Peter, but uh, I... I I would say that elementary school is not the problem. I, I do career days with my kids all through their elementary school years, and I can tell you for that day, I was the most popular guy in our neighborhood, uh, except for the firemen. I hate that guy. <laughs> or the baseball player. Yeah, he brings his truck. That's not fair, right? But he's a neighbor of mine. I think I'm going to, every career day, I'm going to let the air out of his tires so he can't make it to the school. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're hooked in elementary school. So let's, to bring a dose of reality, where we lose them is when they get older and, and they get more thinking about their career and what kind of opportunity they are going to have in the future. And that's when they may get disenfranchised somewhat. That's where we need to make the connection. Um, and I think what it has to do with is just what Peter said is this lull that we had most recently. Uh, we've seen a lot of those cyclical happenings in our, bay, in our careers over the years. And it's primarily because of government spending has fluctuated. And when there's a downturn, we experience that downturn. That's why this activity is so important. Because if this commercial crew and cargo uh, in industry takes off, we're no longer dependent on just NASA's budget going up and down. The private market will spur these innovations, will spur these opportunities. So when kids get closer to high school, they're going to see those opportunities. And it won't just be about NASA. The pie will grow bigger. And that's why I believe this is the right path, not only for NASA, but for the nation. Space has to be cool. It has to be cool to be technical and enter into these kinds of fields. And that's something that SpaceX definitely tries to, to focus on. We, we publish videos on almost every aspect of what we're doing. We try to put great music uh, to those videos. Um, and I think, frankly, the, the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs have made it OK to be nerdy. Um, and I think that's you really need to get kids over the, over the hump of uh, it's OK to be a nerd. Mm -hmm. So I was going to add something. And, and so now that I live, <laughs> speaking of nerds, <laughs> 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 
Now that I live about uh, two and a half miles from Johnson Space Center and about, uh, you know, and I live in a community that's filled with astronauts and people that work at JSC, you know, I, I'd say my kids are extremely privileged and in elementary school, when they go to school, they're surrounded by that environment. You know, parents are all NASA employees or aerospace employees. You know, you have a, a carnival day and astronauts show up and sign pictures and you're kind of inundated with it. it it's a, a great opportunity that I think we benefit for being in such close proximity. The question is how do we take that and kind of replicate that when you're not so close to a Johnson Space Center or something? Mr. Nye has been waiting patiently. Well, yeah, I have a question. But first, let me say the Planetary Society, the world's largest non-governmental space organization, has just started a, um, a kids section because we all got started before we were 10. Part of the reason the Science Guy show was successful, we had the benefit of very good research. You have to get people before you're 10 years old. And then the big turning point is algebra. We have to make sure people learn algebra. So. Uh, Rob, I would say to you, having kids come to your facility once a year is not a small thing. Mm -hmm. That is a huge thing. And if you guys can manage to do that, to do that and keep your, um, what you do, the proprietary stuff uh, mm -hmm. to yourselves, uh, that is not a small thing. That could, dare I say it, change the world. <laughs> now, my question. Uh, we all love going into space. Who wouldn't want to go into space, jumping around big fun? But if we're going to go farther and farther out, uh, humans, after about six months, humans aren't that good. Everybody has to work out four or five hours a day, and you lose a lot of time. When people come back, they came and walked. So are you guys thinking big, big, about some kind of spacecraft that would spin <laughs> so that we would have some level of gravity so that when we go way, way out, uh, you would have the advantage of not losing your bones, your bone density, and you also, it may help people not be so crazy. That is to say, uh, <laughs> help people get along better, uh, these psychological problems, uh, if the, their environment was more like where we grew up. Thank you. 2001, A Space Odyssey. We've all <laughs> remembered what that looked like. Anybody thinking that way? Sorry. <laughs> I think it's we, interesting, We've got a pretty though. big That's problem getting to Leo right now. Yeah, yeah, right. NASA's supposed to be going beyond Leo, right? Uh, right. So, I know it's going to come back to so you gotta go there I'm actually glad you guys didn't answer that question, because I do want them focused on this near-term mission. Uh, that's the one where the real business opportunities lie. I don't think there's a lot of business opportunity uh, in that kind of deep space mission. That's still what NASA is very much about. Um, hopefully, at some point, we can push the boundaries out and turn that over. Um, there are there have been over the years different groups at NASA to sort of look way, way beyond, uh, Bill, and I think there's a group right at NASA today that still does some of that. Um, so yes, I think there are some, some activities along those lines. Uh, looking at the deep space mission, Mars now has become more into our sort of trade space um, for human exploration. That kind of had a lull for a little bit at NASA, but now we're definitely talking about going to asteroids as the next mission and then going on to Mars. Those are very long duration missions and we definitely have to work the, the human countermeasure part of that very strongly. Because right now, today, I don't think uh, we have confidence that we could mount a Mars mission. We definitely need to do more, more technology development. You heard the panel this morning. Uh, that's where those things are going to come from, I think, for those far, far out thinkers. And we're going to need that if we want to take these deep space missions. Back to this side. Yes, my name is Bud Chasteen. I'm a docent here at the Museum of Flight. A space enthusiast, but also a concerned citizen. I want to go backwards in time a little bit and ask a question. I've been finding myself doing that more and more at my age. I was very worried, concerned, and a little angry that we decommissioned the shuttle without having a replacement. My main question is this. We all know what good friends the Russians have been in the past to the United States. What is the danger of some political turmoil happening where they would refuse to uh, fly our astronauts? A minor question. I noticed when they're sending astronauts up, there's usually three at a time. Maybe it's my imagination, but it seems like two out of the three have been Russians. So that's the main question. What is to stop them 
from stopping to fly our astronauts? Answer that one, honestly. Um, you know, Lori talked about it a little bit this morning. We're focused here with people that are in the, in the short run here, concentrating on commercial flight. And I'd rather, I'd, I'd actually be glad to put you in touch with Lori's office and the right people at NASA that are really thinking about those big political issues and international trade issues and let these folks really concentrate on, we've got really limited time here, questions on what are they doing the, the near future, really, in the commercial wor world. That's good. So I don't mean to ignore you. I was just looking to say something. I, I, will, um, I will give you a quick answer, though. Okay. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the things we can do is to properly fund the U.S. commercial space program as we're doing so that the biggest hedge to dealing with that issue is having a domestic capability that can fly as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And if they know that we do have that, then it becomes less a political chip for anyone to use and it becomes more practical. So I think the message back to you and to all of you and all of you who are listening is that's a very important question, a very important issue. The thing that we can do is to make sure that we do our jobs and the government sees this as a very vital program for the United States. And the sooner they do that, the sooner we get to fly, the less that is an issue for all of us. Thank you. Great. Sir. Hi, my name is Dave Christie. Um, I have a one quick comment, which is that the idea that we are going to shift towards the commercial sector handling aspects that NASA used to handle, uh, frankly, we've always had the private sector involved with NASA. As the former administrator Griffin said, that it's been NASA's insight and oversight that has uh, been the guiding role, but we've always brought this private sector in. So I'd just like to make this point that it, this idea that we're going to shift gears and away from what NASA is doing, it's actually we're just going to get rid of the whole function altogether. That, that will be the long-term role because the whole globalized financial system is collapsing right now anyway. Uh, but just one quick question uh, that I mentioned earlier. The Russians have proposed the Strategic Defense of the Earth policy, which was a revival of the old Strategic Defense Initiative under Reagan, which I know Boeing played a, a role in to eliminate the threat of nuclear warfare on the planet, but also to deal with the threats that we face from space, as we saw this asteroid go through. And, uh, and that would be, that was actually their proposal to uh, eliminate the threats they perceived from Obama, who refused to give them assurances on the missile defense systems in Eastern Europe not being aimed at Russia, which we're now in a, the middle of a thermonuclear showdown with Asia. But, so my question would be, would you support the strategic defense of the Earth policy or support opening up a dialogue with the Russians to uh, shift the emphasis away from this insanity of nuclear war and towards dealing with threats we face from space? You know, again, I, I don't want to cut you off or, or prevent anybody who wants to answer, but I know Lori addressed that this morning. And again, these folks are very focused on businesses today, trying to develop uh, a business to, can take people to space soon. And so leaving the big policy issues to the policymakers in Washington is fine with me, unless anybody really wants to weigh in. I go back to another question on this side, see so if we can get the last two before uh, we, our time is up. Hi, Rachel Tillman. I'm also a um, daughter of a uh, space mission operations person with Viking Lander. So I follow the, the geek family line. And I'd like to ask, like, like him, um, I'd like to ask as a business person myself and an innovator with patents who's experienced working in startups and working at some of the companies that have been influential in all of the work done by Boeing, Intel, and then moving on myself as a workforce professional and developing those programs that will sustain us as a nation and a global nation as well. What kinds of investments, and you've talked about them to some extent, what kinds of fiscal investments are you going to do to balance the need to grow your business because we need to put reinvest money in, in growth for companies to continue, um, reinvest in workforce development, and I'm looking at these not as versus each other, but a balance of these types of investments. Um, so workforce de development, growth for your own companies through um, proprietary innovation, and open innovation with universities. So what that mix is. 
Great question. I'd like to take that first, Gwen. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to hit all your points, but I can tell you that SpaceX plows pretty much all our uh, operating revenues back into our operating or our R&D for future programs and for future capability. Yeah, and, I, and I can't give specific numbers either, but um, in the size of the company that we are within Boeing, there's a significant investment in research and development and always advancing technology. You can look at the 787 that just recently flew as a significant investment from the Boeing company on the future technology for commercial aircraft. And I can say that we continually invest in the future for um, our defense and space systems as well. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a shot. It's, uh, um, we, we're in a unique position because we have steady funding and we're going to be designing and building and flying space vehicles 15, 20, 30 years from now, um, uh, regardless of, of how the program changes over time. So uh, um, we, we do a lot of things internally. We, uh, we have a philosophy at Blue Origin. We're, we're not just building a rocket. We're building a company that builds rockets. So we're making those investments in our people, our tools, our, uh, our policies, procedures, uh, facilities. Uh, we have rocket engine test stands, labs, all the equipment that we need to do these things over the long haul. I mentioned mentorship. That's an important thing to me. We have mentors within our organization for our, for our young engineers. We have a rotation program for young engineers. Uh, mentioned the internship as well. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll leave it with, you know, builders win by building. You know, you, you learn through those experiences, but either success or failure, you're going to learn. So you have to keep doing and you have to keep persevering and moving forward. And, What's expected of each individual is really a diversity of skills which they learned on the job. So really the best training programs is just being part of a, of a small company. And I will tell you, we, we hire the kind of people, as many of uh, our panelists do, who are people that are absolutely passionate about their work. So even though the clock may stop at 5 o'clock in terms of what they're getting paid, these are the kind of people that stay t till midnight and will work through the weekend just from the sheer excitement of what we're doing. I'll, uh, I think we all are, this is what we do as companies, we reinvest heavily in, in what we're doing. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different take on the question, and that is that once we are flying, the, the vehicles that we're building have the capability of acting as the scientific test beds in space. And I think we, we oftentimes look at the near, uh, the current activities that we're doing. We're building vehicles, we're going to go to LEO, and we're going to go to space station. But this is an industry that's being built to provide access to low Earth orbit, not just access to the International Space Station. And it's very much in our plans to have a very robust science platform uh, within our vehicle to allow for the facilitation of testing, because there are many other people who have innovations who want to find a way to get those innovations tested in space, and that's a big problem right now. It's a very circular issue. Well, you need heritage to get to space, but you can't get heritage until you get to space. And we want to try to break that, that cycle by providing a way for many people, many researchers, to do the research in space that will enable the next levels of technology. We've got two more questioners, and those will be the last two. Um, so let's go over here first. Thank you. I'm Greg Scheiderer from SeattleAstronomy.com. I was one of the many people who raised their hand that said, yes, I would, I would travel into space. <laughs> However, my, my challenge is that my wife, who is very reasonable in most things, has this crazy notion that space is a dangerous and hostile environment and might exercise veto power about me climbing on one of your vehicles. So you know, any uh, advice you might have for overcoming that objection would be most helpful in the future. Um, <laughs> My, my main question is about how you've gazed into the future about the notion that it's a competitive industry. Is it going to be like, you know, talking about your old technology, you know, Betamax and VHS, is one going to win or is there room for all of your different approaches and technologies as this industry goes forward? Thank you. One of the most important uh, contributors to safety is to uh, fly your capability over and over and over. So SpaceX has designed our, um, our vehicles so that we can deliver satellites to orbit, uh, to, the, to their operational orbit with the Falcon 9, which is crew rated. We can deliver Dragon to the International Space Station, uh, which is crew rated. Uh, we can, uh, so basically we've formulated our strategy on the, on the building blocks of our technology to make sure that we were developing systems that could be re used for many purposes. 
Um, so to let your give you some advice with your wife, I would fly with SpaceX because we will fly <laughs> way more than our friends. <laughs> well, so I guess I'll go after that. <laughs> He's a brave man. Well, I, I'll, I'll start by saying you, you fly on Boeing airplanes, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's our brand. You think about it, the, the Boeing brand is probably more important to our company. Well, I'd say people first, but Boeing brand is an important aspect. And if you think about the fact that you, you know, when we put every, when we build an airplane, the idea is it's got to fly and it's got to be reliable. When we build spacecraft, it's the same thing. When you look at the reliability that, or the designs that we put forward, they're designed with the reliability standards in place. We've worked with NASA on providing human spacecraft for 50 years. We understand what's required to provide first time quality um, and highly reliable systems. So when you look at it from that perspective, I say we've got a, a proven track record of having reliable capability and it's just like stepping on an airplane. It will be. It needs to be. It needs to be, yes. Mm -hmm. From, uh, from our perspective, we just finished the launch of our 410th space mission that we've brought something to space and we've had over 4,000 things that we've built go to space and they've all operated without any on-orbit problems. And it becomes part of the passion and inherent design and I think in the companies here that safety is the most important thing that we have because we don't have an industry unless we remain safe and, and we understand those parameters quite well. It's really uh, an amazing thing to see how much technology is going into these vehicles, but how it's going to be tested, how many times, how many flights is going to be going up. Uh, we believe that uh, we are safe, and I think we all, I think we all believe that there's room for multiple companies in this in this industry. But I will uh, give you my advice for your for your wife is that I had the pleasure of meeting uh, one of the people, one of the most. Uh, fun people that I think I've ever met, and that is Richard Branson's mother, talking about Steve's, uh, Steve's mother. Uh, uh, Richard Branson's mother is now 91, and she raised her hand as wanting to be one of the first people to go to space. I've known her for a number of years, and she has that kind of attitude, and I think one of the things that we like to do is to have people talk to people who have that passion, because they understand that sometimes things that we want to do do take a little bit more courage than, than other things, but that's what makes them worthwhile. I agree that over time there will be uh, markets and, and room for multiple players in this industry, and uh, um, I believe in that strongly. Uh, I think NASA can help to accelerate that by, by doing some things, uh, by, by ceding control of Earth to orbit transportation to, to companies like, like ours up on this panel. And uh, Lori talked about that in her speech a little bit, but, but it's, uh, we need a space economy. We, uh, uh, if NASA is controlling that through detailed specifications and, and the way they procure spacecraft and launch vehicles, um, it's not going to um, be um, en enable uh, entrepreneurs that are out there that haven't gotten into this business just yet um, to, to jump in and, and want to compete on that, on that kind of a ground. So, so NASA can help this in the long run and, and they should strongly consider it. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is pick up actually on Peter's point, um, although I talked about Virgin Galactic today, uh, you know, we're part of the, the Virgin family of companies, and one of it is Virgin America, which is the operator of, of, of Boeing planes and, and others. Um, clearly, it's, it's safety first, and we have tried to imbue that culture in what we're doing at Virgin Galactic, because we realize um, this is the business, and uh, we, we can't afford to have a bad day. So that's why we have a very extensive test program and sort of pick up on, on Mark's point, I thought he was going to go in this direction, which is uh, uh, not only is uh, Richard's mother uh, interested in flying, but actually on our very first commercial flight, Richard wants to fly with his mother and two kids. So uh, we, we joke among ourselves at, at Galactic that uh, we're probably all going to have to be the guinea pigs before he flies to make sure that it truly is the safest vehicle in the world. I think just one other quick comment is that NASA is our partner in this program, as is the FAA. Uh, when we get when we get to fly here in the next few years, it's not like we're doing this as as standalone entities. We're doing it as part of a system that has oversight, regulation, involvement, and those are standards that we're all going to have to meet, or we don't fly. No different than the FAA certifies an airplane, and if if you don't get that certification, you don't put pay, paying passengers on that airplane. We're going to go through the same type of rigorous oversight, involvement, re regulation, and review of our programs before we do take people. One more question. Uh, I would like to uh, make an acknowledgement, not a question, 
Uh, I've been associated with the Museum of Flight. Oh, I'm Jim Tillman, the crusty old Martian. Ever since the Red Barn was the Museum of Flight, Georgia Franklin, once a month, would bring a school bus full of kids and we'd talk about space. Uh, their questions were really inspiring and just helped me keep on doing this stuff. Uh, my daughter, Rachel, who was just in front of me, I forgot to mention, uh, I found a meteorology instrument that was surplus. I did not know it could be surplus. And I called Martin Marietta and said, what else do you have? Oh, we've got the flight spare Viking aeroshell, the lander, the parachute. And what's going to happen to them? I said, oh, they'll probably be all for scrap and melted down. Rachel said, my teacher will want that. <laughs> and uh, she bugged me and bugged me, and so the lander sits upstairs now. When children can get us to do something useful, uh, maybe not what we think is useful, but that's been an inspiration for me and to work with the young kids. And uh, algebra, math, early on, I try to emphasize that too. And thank you very, very much for this great presentation. Well, thank you. I most inspiring people that I've met since I've been here in Seattle is Bill Boeing Jr., who cut the ribbon on Boeing Field here in 1928. He's uh, turning 89 this month and um, sent a note yesterday to Charles Simone on the dedication of the Space Gallery uh, referring to the change in the commercial aircraft industry that he saw in the 20s and 30s and likening this time till now. And that, that puts me in mind of a Great closing quote, I think. Peter Diamandis, who, who founded the X Prize and has been behind a lot of these ideas over the years, often says that before Charles Lindbergh, people who flew in space were called dare, oh, excuse me, flew in aircraft were called daredevils. After Lindbergh, they were called passengers. <laughs> uh, up till now, people who flew in space were called astronauts. The people at this table are going to make it possible to be the rest of us. So we thank all of them for being here today and thank all of you for being in the panel.